<laughs> Brilliant. If everyone would like to mute themselves, that'd be great. Thanks. And I'll get started. And just there we go. Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our international audience. Uh, this is the first in a series of Madasis UK webinar events. We have a full programme for the autumn and winter, and that's for everyone. So theatre teams, registrars, fellows and consultants as well. I'd like to introduce our fantastic faculty and start with our chairperson, who's Mr Ecclesley from Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London. He assures me he's going to try his best to stay neutral throughout the debate. And also he's trying to, he will try and keep the faculty to time. Uh, he'll give them a warning and if they don't want to listen, <laughs> then he's given me permission to use the mute button. So watch out. <laughs> now to the panel in our running order will be Mr. Raspalu from Derby, Mr. Russell from Swansea in South Wales, Mr. Horwitz from Chelsea and Westminster, Mr. Nikai from uh, the Royal Free in London, and finally Mr. Molodina from St. George's in London. If you do have any questions throughout the debate, if you use the chat function, um, yeah, put your question in and your, and your hospital that you work in. And just to begin with, before I hand over to Mr. Eckersley, I'd just like to start with a poll. Bear with me. So, do you use headless compression screws for intermedullary fixation of mid-shaft metacarpal fractures? Yes, routinely. Yes, occasionally. No, but I'm interested for the future. I've only ever assisted as I'm a trainee, or no, I would never choose to. I'll just give you another sort of 10 seconds. Seventy-five percent of you have voted so far. Right, I'll share. Okay, share results. There we go. So quite a big number there interested for the future. So I'd like to hand over to Mr. Ecclesley now uh, and enjoy. Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody. Um, <clears throat> just a little bit of Zoom etiquette. So if uh, everybody could keep themselves muted until maybe the end when we, we're uh, going to have a discussion and we're going to allow for one question after each uh, presentation. Uh, to allow a bit of handover time. And if you could please send your questions to the chat room to everyone uh, so that uh, we can all see them and then we can ask the panelists at the end how to do it. Um, you, know, you can be as forthright as you want. We're a, a good community of hand surgeons. We, we like each other a lot and uh, we don't take offense at disagreement, providing it's done in a polite manner um, and uh, you know that it's not offensive to anybody but it's uh, you know very important that we do ask the questions you want to ask about this particular uh, method um, I think we probably all have our own opinions as we always do and uh, uh, maybe this is an opportunity to have a think about whether you might change your opinion uh, about uh, certain things with regard to metacarpal fracture so I'm going to hand over now to my good friend from Derby, Carlos, and he's going to start us off. Uh, and uh, yes, we will mute people if they speak for too long. Uh, Carlos, you're still muted. Carlos, you're still muted. Do that again. That's uh, good. Okay. Is that is that better? Can you hear me all right now? Uh, yeah, that's better. Uh, we're going to center ourselves on diaphyseal metacarpal fractures, and as we know, the metacarpals have a. Uh, strong ligaments around the MCP and the volar plates are joined by the intermetacarpal ligament and proximally has very strong ligaments. So in a way, you already have an X fix for the central ones and a good hold on the, on the border ones. So many of them you don't need to do very much. And what I wanted to do is just go through a little bit the uh, a spectrum of treatment that you have. So some of them you can just put in a body strapping, they're stable 
injuries get them moving, uh, some of them, they'll be more displaced and you may want to reduce them and hold them. And you can do that conservatively with the, with the cast. And the one we use is the one that was popularized by Nicholas Barton. Uh, you cannot put a lot of wool because otherwise you will have no control. But if the patient is not allergic, you can use just some elastoplast, some felt. And, and this is the case actually I had for a long time. And I think Andy Logan did that one. I think he's in the, when he was working with us, that's how, how, how old it is. And, and you get a, this three point molding and you can, you can get them moving with this. And this is, this is a good treatment to make, get them in a, in a better position. Another treatment is intramedular fixation. This is again, it's been around for a long time, popularized by Fouché. Uh, it could be called the bouquet technique because it looks like a bouquet of flowers with good, good results. It's, it's reasonably simple, it's cheap, avoids opening the fracture site and uh, promotes callus. Um, and the indications are a bit the same than, than for the intramedullary screw. So a fracture like that, that's you consider that significantly displaced. And that's what you need. You need a good image intensifier, you need K wires. It's good to have a, a hand wire driver. You can just bend the wire and manipulate it, but I don't find that very, very easy. Uh, and I use uh, um, uh, an easy drive, it's the biggest easy drive. You put the K wire in, and as you press the two handles together, hose the wire, and it gives you very good control. Uh, shape the wire a bit like the ski. Then you sell the hole at the base of the metacarpal. Uh, you need to be careful of the dorsal branch of the ulnar nerve there, and then just make the hole a bit bigger than the wire and get the wires in by hand and manipulate it. Always check the rotation clinically, not on x-rays. May always do whatever you do with a metacarpal that you've got good rotation. So if you have two metacarpals like that, um, you can easily get a couple of wires. Uh, the thinnest uh, medullary canal is always the ring finger. If you have problem with one of them, will be the ring. Uh, the other ones are usually easy to put. And this is the case that I show you first. There's actually a case from Ravi Molina. He did that a couple of weeks ago. And you could say, well, this is ideal for an intramedullary screw. You don't want the deformity of the index or the middle because you have hardly any movement at the CMC joint. So any deformity will have a, a, an impact. <coughs> Excuse me. And this was treated with a, with a wire, prism with reduce, allows compression, and that will help very nicely. Of course, it has its problems. Um, uh, you, the, if you put the wire too far and you create a canal distally, then the wire can migrate. It can damage the extensor tendon. So you need to be careful with it. Then you can, <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> you can go for internal fixation, like a screw on a transition plate or a DCP plate. That allows you uh, an early mobilization, like we did in this guy, and that's him at three weeks. Some fractures you will have to fix with with the screws, like this one, but these are not the ones we're talking. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. So I'll leave you with a thought by Swanson that hand fractures can be complicated by deformity from no treatment, a stiffness from over treatment, and both from, from poor treatment. And we'll open, we'll open the discussion with that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Carlos. Um, I haven't seen any uh, questions put up there to, uh, to uh, challenge you. Um, the, the, only, the, the only, the only challenge I would have would be, what about doing nothing with a single metacarpal fracture? No, absolutely. Um, I guess uh, uh, there are stable fractures, um, particularly the, the ring and the middle. I think it's good to give them little body strapping or something like that to remind them not to use it. But uh, moving the fingers uh, will prevent any rotation deformity. If you splint them, you may get a, a deformity, but a rotation deformity. But if, if they move together, uh, they correct the deformity themselves. So you don't get the rotation, which is the only problem you, you, can, you can get with these ones if you're not careful. Absolutely. Any, any other comments from anybody else want to uh, uh, add anything?
at this point. No. Okay. Well, should we uh, should we uh, move on then to uh, Mr. Russell, who's going to speak to us next about uh, metacarpal shaft fractures? Is that your slide there, Dougie? I think it is. Yeah. Hopefully, you can all see it. Yeah, we can all see it. And we're waiting, waiting to hear your forthright views about uh, this particular injury. I'm looking for. Thank you very much, Rupert, and hello, everyone. Um, I think I've been invited to be a bit contentious here, uh, not for the first time. Um, so our cannulated compression screw is a good idea. Um, uh, and the more I think about that, the, uh, the more I worry that it's a triumph of technique over common sense. Um, we've got lots of good ways of treating these fractures, and then they normally do very well. So what are, the, what are the issues? Well, the first one's the anatomy. Uh, the metacarpal is not a straight bone. It's got a, a degree of anti-curvature, just like the femur. And when we use an intradural device in the femur, we have a device of anti-curvature. Um, the other issue is that this fracture is often in young people, uh, particularly young males that go around punching things they shouldn't. Um, and these guys have got very narrow isthmus, particularly uh, in, in, the, uh, in the fourth and fifth, as, as Carlos has already pointed out. Uh, which can make fixation with screws difficult. And then there's the, the big elephant in the room, isn't there, really? Why on earth would you violate a normal joint and a normal tendon when you don't need to? Absolute madness. We can do lots of other things to stabilise these fractures. Uh, as I've already said, a lot of them are punch injuries. Uh, and if you punch somewhere, the bit where you're going to make your little incision is exactly uh, where the, the skin contusion, the soft tissue contusion is going to be make an infection more likely. What if they get infected? Carlos has already mentioned infection around K-wise. That's not a disaster. You just take them out uh, and, and treat the infection. If this gets infected, you've got an infected joint. Uh, and as we've already said, this is in young people uh, and it could be a disastrous complication, although I recognize it's rare. Periprosthetic fracture, another issue. Uh, I'll address that in the slide in a minute. And then cost. We've already talked about K-wires. I'm a big fan of K-wires for these sort of fractures. They're cheap as chips. Whereas these sort of screws are really quite expensive. And I don't know what sort of hospitals you work in, but I'm always being driven to, to reduce costs in my hospital. And as I said before, we've got established, safe and effective ways of treating these fractures uh, that don't endanger the joint. So we've already looked at this, uh, as Carlos has said, Sometimes that isthmus is very narrow. If you look at the, um, the second and third there, tiny, tiny, tight isthmus. You don't need a bouquet necessarily. Uh, one wire will, uh, will often do the trick and stabilize these fractures. I totally agree about um, strapping the fingers to, uh, to control rotation. Uh, I tend to cut the wires very short, either down on the bone or tuck them just inside the uh, metathesis of the bone to, to avoid any sort of soft tissue irritation. So I think this is the mainstay of my treatment, these sort of fractures, and it works really, really well and we haven't been anywhere near that NP joint. And actually, you've got to be pretty clumsy to get a wire through it. So uh, normally if you do this under image control, uh, it, it's very easy to get the wire as long as you need, uh, it needs to be. Uh, plates, again, I just mentioned briefly, I'm not a great plater, but if you want absolute stability, you might do in sort of high level sports and you want to get back really quickly. If you're going to plate, plate tuck the plate around the side a little bit, less likely to cause the, uh, the tendon problems that they're renowned for. And then we get onto these oblique and spiral fractures, uh, which are actually quite common in metacarpals. Uh, and these are the ones that don't actually do nearly as well with uh, intramural fixation. They're not actually stable. Uh, don't forget that although we've got a narrow isthmus in a metacarpal, it flares very quickly, both proximally and distally. So we haven't got any sort of distal and proximal locking, so um, they don't do so well. But also, as you can see from that x-ray on the left, we've often got malrotation. And that's really poorly tolerated by patients. And the best way of getting an accurate correction of that is anatomical reduction of the fracture uh, and, and stabilization. And you don't need plates for these particularly to neutralize them. Uh, in the right sort of fracture, a couple of uh, lag screws can do really, really well, as you can see in this, uh, this case here. Uh, this is a case I did very recently. So this lady's a um, 17 year old. She plays the national cricket team. She'd sustained this injury playing cricket. I'll put it to you that would be absolute lunacy to violate this young lady's joint. Um, and I wouldn't even consider doing that. Uh, again, you can see there's a bit of malrotation there. 
uh, and we've managed this just with a couple of lag screws and no soft tissue problems, minimal scar that's tucked away in the lateral border of the hand, uh, and she's doing really, really well. So I think, yeah, I, I would be scared to be sticking any, anything through this lady's joint. Uh, and a quick one about uh, periprosthetic fractures. Uh, I've already mentioned that this is a, a particular uh, portion of the population that, uh, that often sustain these fractures with punching type injuries. Uh, and they're often serial offenders, as we'll all recognize, I'm sure. Um, I don't use these intramedullary cannulated screws, but I think if you get a fracture around one of those, that could present a really, really difficult problem to, uh, to, to fix and stabilize. As you can see on the right here, this gentleman sustained a further fifth metacarpal fracture. Uh, and if, if you think the, the deformity warrants it, it's very easy just to straighten this back out again, and off he goes until the next time. Although um, we're not talking about head fractures, I wanted to just briefly mention this. Uh, this is an awful fraction, really difficult to manage. And this really is just to sort of big up the old simple K wire again, uh, because we've got a very, very good reduction and good functional outcome with one single 1.6 K wire. Just to, just to remind you, don't, uh, don't leave the point on it, leave it blunt so you can elevate that joint surface. So um, it, not only can it treat uh, diaphyseal fractures very well, it's very useful for the more complex fractures of the head and neck. So really, I want to leave you with this quote that was um, told to me by one of my very good colleagues and friends recently. He's actually a plastic hand surgeon. He told me that cannulated screws are like tourist rental vehicles. They're driven by people who don't know what they're doing and don't know where they're going. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dougie, for that uh, yeah, controversial final statement. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt there are people who will have uh, something to say about that. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think we all know that there are many different ways to uh, treat these injuries and we're trying to minimize the, the soft tissue damage that we do by whatever technique we do. Um, and uh, whether you do plating, k wires intramedullary screws, whatever, whatever you do, you need to be comfortable that you're going to be able to achieve the outcome that you, that you want. Um, so do you, do you ever plate a fracture or is it always k wires? I would never say never. No, I certainly would, uh, would plate occasionally, but less and less commonly nowadays, I must admit, uh, compared to, to some years ago. Uh, and I must just point out that I'm not completely against cannulated screws. They're great for a scaphoid. <laughs> okay. Good comment there from Graham Chung to everybody, as you can probably see. So if there aren't any other questions, we're going to move on. And I think uh, um, Max is going to talk next. Max Horwitz, my colleague from the Chelsea and Westminster, who's uh, almost certainly got something good to say. Max. Thank you, Rupert. I'm just going to get my sharing up now. And screen share. Here we go. <clears throat> all right. Can you all see things nicely? Okay, so uh, look, I, I thought I'd talk about the mechanics and the biomechanics here. Um, I'll start off by saying I'm not a user. Um, I've thought about it, but I thought it about it about a year and a half ago. So I actually took a whole lot of my not so healthy uh, dead cadaveric patients to the lab. And I have gone ahead with a series of fixations comparing all the common techniques actually in phalanges, not rather than metacarpals. Um, and my results are early and provisional, but I've got some significant concerns probably regarding torsional stability, which is admittedly more important for fingers than for metacarpals, but um, early lab results are worrying. Um, I think you've got to compare apples with apples and fractures with fractures. And um, I'll, I'll come to that in the paper very quickly. I think most of the research and most of the papers, and when you look at there's one systematic review, which is more of a poor clinical review, not a proper Prospero review, the numbers are in people's series are quite small. And just remember, this, this isn't completely new. It's been around for about the last seven years, um, and it's not mainstream. So you might be wondering why it's not mainstream. Um, and I think we've got a, 
a group of enthusiasts versus pragmatists. I know some of my fairly non-operative colleagues are not on this panel tonight, but I know a couple of them in the UK that run around at top level who wouldn't operate on most of the fractures here, whether it was screws, pins or plates. So I'm just gonna go through a few papers. Mine's the shortest of the presentation of everyone, but this is um, a nice paper, which is in hand, which is uh, the official journal of the American Association of Hand Surgery where they took a whole group of metacarpals in the laboratory and compared plating to screws. And without any doubt, the plating was mechanically stronger. So just remember that if you've got the wrong kind of patient or the wrong kind of fracture and you're pushing the indications a little bit, be careful, you are not dealing with the strongest kind of fixation. Um, paper published by uh, Dr. Pinal, who was probably one of the first advocates of this procedure, has very good, very nice results. It's a small, smallish number of cases. But remember what, he, what his conclusion is, that comminuted fractures require more complex configurations. Don't, just because everything looks like a nail, don't hit everything with a hammer. Um, that's probably the message from this particular paper. And there's beautiful illustrations and it's nice early technique. You know, this was published six years ago. Um, another paper from Journal of Hand Surgery, some of you will recognize Dr. Belsky, who um, Belsky technique, just a, a K-wire across the metacarpophalangeal joint with the flexed MP joints. Um, probably the key thing about this is it was, it was small, it was retrospective. And if you looked at the fractures that they treated, I think a lot of these were fractures which wouldn't make it sort of past the second door in Cardiff or Swansea or uh, Manchester or Liverpool on a Saturday night or London on a Saturday night because they're fifth metacarpal neck fractures which really don't need much more than a bit of support for a couple of weeks in early mobilization. So they did get great results. I do question whether a lot of those patients needed surgery. Um, Another biomechanical uh, paper, this time from Korea, where they compared uh, K-wire, IM screw and plating. Um, I mean, the conclusion is over here that uh, plate is strongest, screw is second, K-wire is next. So, you know, that's pure biomechanics. The paper doesn't really comment on torsional testing. Um, so I do worry whether or not that, 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 been underplayed and how how well the screw would do in torsion testing. One thing that they do mention, which I would love to hear from the experts at the end who do these regularly, is what is the significance of the diameter of your screw relative to the fifth metacarpal? So, you know, I'm I'm six foot four, I have a size eight and a half, nine gloves in theatre sometimes, and my fellow is like five foot one and wears like five and a half gloves we surely can't both have the same screw. And there's not much of a range in terms of screws. If you think of something like a tibial nail or a femoral nail, you've got a lot of lengths and you've got a lot of diameters. So again, same question about nail and hammer. Um, a final paper came out uh, fairly recently. Uh, for me, this is the same elephant in the room that Dougie came up with. Glad I didn't put the elephant picture but nicely illustrated in their CT scans here. Um, you do get a whopping hole. How significant that hole is, I don't know. Obviously in my big metacarpal, you're gonna put a big screw and you're gonna need a big hole. Um, maybe relatively it doesn't matter because I've got a large cartilage surface. Um, and then what they did comment again, this is uh, more related to a phalanx rather than metacarpal. Um, you've got a situation where one direction compared to the other gives you a bigger hole. So, like I said, this is the shortest of the talks. Uh, and if you're feeling zoomed out, I'm glad to help reduce the zoom length. Um, appraise your literature. This is just a small snippet in a small sample. But just remember, this might be seen as a procedure which is new in your hospital. And if you have a problem, you're gonna to have to be able to back it up with some kind of evidence review or take it to a new procedures committee. So always look what's out there. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Max. Uh, any particular comments or questions from anybody? Um, I've, there's one comment from uh, Graham Chung saying it, it doesn't really matter because what we're talking about really in metacarpal fractures is uh, that uh, absolute stability is not essential for uh, bone healing or for mobilization. And we sort of know that because individuals with just an isolated metacarpal fracture will mobilize fairly rapidly, whether you've stuck a wire in a, a plate, you know, or, or done something else. And I guess it'll come at the end, but I, I'd be interested to know on your point about the size of the metacarpals themselves and the shape of them, and they're all very different. Um, uh, is really is the screw anything more than just a, a big K wire? Because uh, yeah, it strikes me that, uh, but I'm sure you know it'll come out in the discussion at the end. I, I'm not going to sort of I, I put that out there for the moment and can see Jamil waving at me rapidly. But I'm gonna I'm gonna mute you now and uh, I'm gonna move on and Darius is going to uh, now uh, speak to us. So thank you very much, Max, and we may or may not see you at the end. So um, hi, um, I'm gonna just talk about um, really the indications uh, in my practice where I use these cannulated screws. Um, I mean, the focus today is metacarpal fractures, but they can be used in pharyngeal fractures for joint fusion, um, I, in our hospital, we use the Dupuy synthes, and we've only got two sizes, 2.4 millimeter and 3.0. Uh, Medatis offers a range 1.7 to 3.0. Um, in terms of contra contraindications and caution, if I mean, if it's a very very heavily contaminated or open fracture, um, I, you 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 shouldn't really possibly be using these types of um, uh, these cannulated screws and also if it's comminuted fractures as well. Um, oblique and spiral fractures, I think is risky. I, we have seen some problems with it um, and also an osteoporotic bone and rheumatoid bone as well. And on the right, there's um, two cases that we published um, just as a short communication in the plastics literature. Uh, but we were doing a three finger revascularization. This is when I was on fellowship and we tried to use uh, the cannulated screw to minimize dissection in all in two digits. And unfortunately, the second digit, we used probably too big a screw and it started squeaking and it broke. So you've got to you've got to use it in the right situation. So as Max said, it, it all started with the work of uh, Del Pinal. Um, you can see beautifully illustrated in his paper how he tried to change his practice to uh, stabilize fractures with um, a minimal ap approach in terms of dissection. You can see on the left all those plates that he's put in. He's had to open up the digits. I, I would, certainly wouldn't do it like that. I think it would be uh, the patient would need to come back with a tenolysis and remove the plates. Um, uh, and as um, uh, Carlos said, there's a number of ways to fix these fractures. So cross KYs, you can see on the left, this is a poorly fixed uh, KY, not by myself, but uh, uh, it's ended up in a non-union, which is pretty rare. You can also do bouquet wiring, uh, but in my hands, I find bouquet wiring can be difficult. It can be sometimes challenging to get 3.8 uh, uh, wires in there um, and also plating, but plating obviously in closed, if it's a closed fracture you want to fix, um, it obviously involves more dissection, soft tissue dissection, and um, uh, as, uh, and um, uh, you can violate the surrounding tissues. So I'll just show just one or two case examples. So this patient came and saw me during the height of the COVID pandemic, and he'd had a crush injury to his hand. He had a closed injury, second and third metacarpal, um, and um, I put in two cannulated screws. I could have, I probably would have plated him. That's the other thing I could have done. But I think with all his soft tissue swelling, I think I would have had some, some problems. And I did this um, under local anesthetic. Can you make a fist, make a fist. I would have probably, if I had regional capacity, because we're in the height of the pandemic, I probably would have done it under regional. But all I needed to do was a mini open incision at the back of the knuckle and past these two KYs. And he's done very well. 
Um, he's made a, made a full recovery. This is an, another case. Um, uh, I did this on, on fellowship, uh, bilateral fifth metacarpal fractures. Um, one side, it was a short oblique fracture and probably used too short a screw. And actually the screw is bent. These weren't Dupuis synthes, these are Medatis screws. Um, and on the right, there was no issues. This is him at one week. Um, and we had him moving pretty much immediately, but we changed our, our protocol after this one. We we're a little bit more cautious. And also this is not a metacarpal fracture, but this was a, for a, a, a three finger revascularization um, with a circular saw and um, uh, used uh, cannulated screws to actually just stabilize uh, all three digits as the DIP joint had been uh, destroyed in all. And you can see the digits were vascularized here. And this is his long-term uh, outcome. So it can be used in multiple settings and also some spe special scenarios. So this is a recent case that I did a 10 day old fracture of the P1. And um, you could, I mean, you could reduce this by opening it up and putting a K wire, but you won't get that compression that you get with a cannulated screw. Um, and this one on the right, another closed injury, very unusual injury. The, the fifth metacarpal head has kind of rotated 180 degrees. And I think, I mean, you, I think Mr. Russell showed some pictures of a, a K wire, um, but you won't get that compression um, with such a comminuted fracture. Um, and I think you, you'd get a better result in terms of compression. But the, the thing is, I do agree with them. The articular surface is concerning um, I mean, long-term follow-up is only two years, and that's the, the Calcagni group. But as a lot of papers have come out recently showing that um, it's only 4% of the, the joint surface. And I think Jamil will touch upon this as well a bit later on. Um, just some advantages. It's a fast technique. You can do it under local anesthetic, minimal dissection. There's, there are some papers that show faster recovery compared to KYs and plating. And remember, plating in, uh, has got uh, significant complications in literature, more than it's up to 22%. Um, and the only way to kind of know more about this technique is through collaboration and research. And I think at the last journal club that I hosted, this is, we, we talked about maybe doing a trial. Um, this is a good paper on the right, uh, just by a uh, group in the States. It's not a very, um, it's, it's very weak um, evidence, so level three, level four evidence. And the, the, these are the papers that I, I recommend people to read, just my last slide. Um, uh, biomechanical study by Calcagni, comparing it to plating, and the mini open versus percutaneous technique. So I use a mini open technique, and that's actually been shown uh, to reduce damage to the tendon and articular surface. Um, and I think um, Jamil can make some comments uh, as he's got a much bigger experience than me. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Darius. I think uh, Ryan's brought up an interesting one because uh, looking at um, the uh, uh, x-rays that you showed, one of mm -hmm. the things again I was going to bring up is the risk in uh, using these screws of actually distracting the fracture. So if the, if the fracture is, you know, the, the compression you achieve with a, with a screw of this nature is not great. And there are many, many studies to show that. Mm -hmm. So if there's any gapping at the fracture, you're very unlikely to be able to compress it satisfactorily. So I would put down that as one of the risks that uh, I would see, unless of course it's acting like a K wire and it doesn't have any fixation in the bone. And in which case the fracture will compress itself. <laughs> So that's my only comment, and I think uh, that's what Ryan Trickett's just brought up. So we're going to move on, and uh, Jamil is going to uh, uh, finish us off with uh, uh, he's even more enthusiastic. And, uh, we're going to see a video. You okay, Jamil? You okay, Jamil. It's, it's new. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so here's a, a just a technique video, just quickly to show. Um, you hopefully you can see everything there. Uh, I 
it takes this is accelerated this takes about two minutes and 30 seconds on here but actually it takes about 10 minutes to do the whole thing so i obviously you check with palpation see where the fracture is see where the head is uh you need to be aiming along the dorsum um so it's not although the bone in the canal as we've heard is a curved bone and curved canal we want to aim at a straight uh through so we aim slightly dorsal this is just a pa view yeah. just to show so once this the wire is in place i use i don't i used to open up and actually cut through the tendon and do a mini open and see it i don't do that anymore because actually you cause less damage just by dilating so i use the the the, the um, countersink to dilate and then the measure and i just push the measure down to just check that i'm roughly in the right place now i want the screw to be within the the, the isthmus uh, the, the narrowest part of the court um the canal and yes it does make a big difference how big the canal is where in terms of the feel of how the screw goes in I'm just making sure that the screw isn't pinching on the skin too much and pushing the skin in then i get the reduction just as i'm crossing the fracture site making sure that i'm okay i do all these things under local anesthetic now so he's awake uh, and he's helping check that there's no rotation as i advance now, just when uh, uh, Rupa was just talking about the, um, the distraction. So here you'll see that as I approach the head, engaging in the head, I push to engage it properly. You'll hear this clicking. That's where it's gripping in that cortex. You see it's a tight grip there. You've got to be really careful when you hear that sound. Make sure that you're not, not advancing it too quickly. And you get a feel of how much you can cope with before the screw breaks. I have broken one that's screw. So there are, there is a learning curve. This way. isn't a, Make a fist. Uh, All the way down. you know, I've, I've straight gone through again. some errors, uh, which I have improved. So I think it's a again. technique that Make I have fist. certainly improved. This, we have one week now. This is one week post-op and this is two Make weeks post-op. Make again. That comes all the way in. Is there any pain now? No. Is there any pain during the operation? Um, not during the operation, within the next day. Um, I was back on my desk working full time on a computer. Okay. So you were back at work the next day. Yeah, back at work the next day. So uh, I mean, it's uh, the, obviously that's a good example, um, but many of these examples are good examples. I think it there are caveats to this. Um, I'll stop the share for a second while I talk. So there are there are caveats to this. So really, it, it's not a, uh, appropriate for every case. I completely, you know, I'm enthusiastic. I've done about forty metacarpals now, and uh, and I treat most of my metacarpals conservatively still. I think that's the right way to do it. Uh, there, I give a patient a choice. I think one thing that we don't do very well is, uh, is we, we concentrate a lot on function and function is by and absolutely the most important thing. But what we don't necessarily concentrate on, and I know that there are a lot of orthopedic surgeons here, we don't concentrate on cosmesis as much. Cosmesis is important, the hand is on show, the face and the hand are on show and we need to we shouldn't compromise function for cosmesis but why not get cosmesis as well and i think that's not unreasonable uh the we have to balance everything including the lots of factors so for some people they need to get back to work quickly for some people they don't for some people are, they're going to punch uh, again don't do it in those people for oblique fractures don't do it in those people you know there are plenty of cases where we shouldn't do it, and nobody's arguing. I'm certainly not arguing that we we should do this for everybody. It's not for everybody. Um, there are lots of concerns with plates. Uh, there are lots of concerns with KYs, uh, and there are concerns with intermediary screws. And uh, just to address some of these, the articular surface, you know, it's still unknown. And I I welcome a study. We should do a study on this uh, to find out how much of a clinical impact it has. We know that it's not a huge percentage. Uh, we know that sometimes if you're uh, causing a lot of damage or have a, a metal reaction there, then you can get uh, a lot of synovitis. My experience so far has been anecdotally, you know, I'm collecting evidence, but I don't have strong evidence myself that it doesn't seem to have an impact at all yet. It's still early, obviously. Screw failure, I've had one, you know, it can break. Um, uh, there are, some people have described other cases where they've broken. I think that's, that's fair, but then plates can break and wires can break. Uh, taking it out, you know, you can get an infection, but you can get an infection in a scaphoid screw. So all these things, they, they haven't stopped people using the screws in, in other indications. People say it's an unproven technique, but as uh, Max said earlier, you know, it's been around for a long time. It's been around for seven or eight years. 
uh, first papers were coming out then, and there were reasonable numbers. Uh, it hasn't taken off worldwide uh, for everybody, and that's fair enough. I don't think it necessarily needs to. There are other options. People say that it's increased cost. I, I think it's about £150 to £200, depending on what kit you've got per screw. That's cheaper than a plate and, uh, and screws construct for a transverse fracture. Now, uh, it's not cheaper than a wire, but I think there will probably, if we look at it, there'll probably be more uh, soft tissue. There's a greater soft tissue disruption with K-wires, even if you're using a, uh, a technique from approaching it proximally and, and with minimal access, you still have to dissect a little bit. Here, no dissection at all. So I, I think that it is has its place and it's not for everybody. Um, I think as long as people are thoughtful as to what the indications are for those people, uh, I think it's, a, it's another tool to have in our tool belt. Um, I was just thinking back when you were mentioning before, a few things that were commenting. Uh, I, I, I agree that punches don't do it in them. Uh, if you can uh, avoid it. There are a lot who are. I think the screw sizes, I was going to say here, the screw sizes, I, I agree with, um, uh, with Graham that actually just, we're, we're doing a K-wire plus. This is not just a K-wire. It's like a K-wire, but it's got a little bit of grip. Uh, in some people who've got a very wide canal, then literally all you're doing is providing a little bit of internal splintage and you're relying on them uh, mobilizing early with no splint and uh, and healing by with a little bit of callus around there. That's fine. We're not going for rigid fixation, or at least I'm not in those cases. Um, and that may make you think against it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Jamil. Okay, I Jamil. I that was uh, an excellent presentation. And I'm going to open it up to uh, anybody who uh, would like to make any comments. So if you if anybody's out there who would like to say something, please unmute yourself, uh, announce your name and what your question is, and then we can take it on from there. So has anybody got any specific questions that they would like to put to the panel or comments hi. to make? Yeah, hi Rupert, this is John Compton here. Can you hear us? Um, the, yeah. uh, I think it's, um, I, I put um, large K wires across joints quite uh, routinely. Um, and also up, uh, through the metacarpal head before I do, when I do metacarpal osteotomies to get the alignment right. It's the easiest way to do it. But there is a definite size you can um, go up to before the billiard ball stops rolling by the, how big a hole you put in it. And so has anybody actually looked at how big a screw head you can put through? Or in fact, more importantly, the uh, shaft to the screwdriver, because that's the biggest thing you're actually going to put through the uh, articular surface to put it down the medulla. Um, because um, you have to presumably go straight through the um, mesocarpal head in the middle of it. You can't go dorsal or in any sort of non-articular position. You've got to put it through the, um, through the head. And obviously the, the amount of hole you make is very dependent on how well it um, will glide afterwards and amount of damage. And that's one question. The second question is having um, had to deal with uh, intermetacarpal rods for wrist arthrodesis put in through the metacarpal head. Um, that's fine unless it breaks or you get a non-union and it breaks and it's very difficult to remove things and to actually retrieve it. And as, as we have with all things, it's the um, ability to remove things is important for, for decision making as, as uh, actually putting in. It's, it's dead easy to put in but God help, it would be hard to get out if you're in problems, which is, is my view on it. But uh, um, I'm, 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 I could actually be doing it in about a week's time for a metacarpal osteotomy. But, um, but, I'm, but those are a couple of things I really would, would um, I think it ought to be thought about before you, you start putting screws right down the middle of Madonna. Okay, thank you. Does anyone uh, like to uh, comment yeah, on that? <laughs> I'm my views. in agreement to, with uh, a lot of those things. I think the get out clause is a very important one. So I don't know if there, has anybody had a complication where they've had to remove one of these screws from the bone? Very difficult. We, we had to use a diamond burr um, to remove it and then we couldn't remove all of it. Um, and one of my colleagues at the Royal Freeze had to remove one. 
and he had to open everything up and literally just burr the bone and just remove it. It's it quite, quite nasty. Um, Jamil, I don't know if you've had any experience in removing. Uh, firstly, Carlos was wanted to say something. Uh, I don't know if, if you still want to say it. Go ahead, Jamil. Uh, so I've I've had two I've had to remove two screws. One at the time, so it broke, uh, and I didn't have a head anymore to remove it. Uh, that was a, uh, quite uh, stressful under local anaesthetic to take the screw out that had uh, no head. So I had to over drill it. Uh, the head, the hole in the metacarpal head in the end was about four and a half millimeters a diameter after all of that. Uh, but I did manage to get it out. It was an ordeal. It took about an hour and a half. Uh, and that was early on. That was about my third or fourth screw. Uh, I haven't broken one since because I understand the squeaking and the sound there. So I think it, it is a problem potentially. I haven't, as I said, had one since because I kind of feel I know what to look for and I have experience to, to take them out. I had took one out uh, delayed uh, for a non-union of a uh, thumb IPJ uh, fusion. That was, uh, that was an error of choice. Uh, it, the canal was too wide. She had osteoporotic bone. There was no grip, there was no compression and it just wobbled around and didn't do anything. So I had to take that out, but that was easy. That just came out very easily. It's not a big deal. I think if, if the reason to take a screw out is either it's broken or it's uh, like later on, if it's in a metacarpal, either it's broken or it is infected. If it's infected, then that usually will happen early on. It's unlikely to be a late infection. Uh, if it's early on, then you've still got your hole in the metacarpal head. It won't have healed over. So I would just do an arthrotomy, open it up and take it out. That is a big deal. It hasn't happened to me yet. Uh, I, you know, it's the same thing happens, I guess, when you put a scaphoid in. I haven't had a scaphoid fracture, uh, a scaphoid screw infected yet. Uh, but I, you know, it's a potential problem there as well. I think if your fracture screw breaks in the metacarpal, I think uh, Thomas Giesen talked about that last time in the in your in the in the previous in another uh, webinar, that you you it's a big deal. You'll have to just open it up, open up the the dorsum of the hand, get inside there, uh, get it and take the pieces out. It's a it's not a nice thing to have to do, but have, hopefully that won't happen, and it's going to be quite rare, I think. Uh, Joe, I'm going to stop you there just a, in a minute. Um, yeah, anybody else got any comments? I mean, I, I would comment that uh, a technique where destruction of the bone is necessary to take the implant out is something people have to think about really carefully because, uh, you know, taking k -wires out is easy. Taking a plate out is easy. It's there in front of you. Uh, I mean, on occasion, you might have to do something more. Um, so I think it's just something for people to bear in mind. And the other thing is, how easy is it when you're starting off to get the k wire in the precise position where you feel that it's going to go down the because you know with the squeaking and the breaking screw that's almost certainly because you're trying to put a straight object down a bent bone and uh, that that's not i mean I, I would as an orthopedic surgeon it doesn't fit with me putting a straight object down a bent bone but that's uh, yeah and as that anthea Davies raised this <laughs> raised this point that maybe orthopedics and plastics have a different approach, but we, we could discuss that on another day. I, I think if you're if you're putting a cone in a wedge into a into a compre into a, a cylinder, then obviously as you get further into the cylinder, if it wedges in, then you're in real trouble. These are tight. This is a very thin piece of metal a wrap, it, because it's cannulated screw. So the actual thickness of the metal screw is tiny. It doesn't cope with torsional forces. So once it wedges in, trying to undo it, even once you get that squeaking, if it's actually locked, trying to undo it, you're going to tort and it'll it'll snap the head off. So it is a big deal to do that. So that's when I would ream it or drill it. Normally I don't drill uh, drill over it. So there's no no power tools involved at all. Uh, I In that case, I measure it always before. And if it's too narrow, I won't use it. I won't use this technique. Okay. Carlos, did you want to say something? Yeah, I wanted to make a couple of technical comments. Going back to John Comson's very appropriate comments, uh, the, the entry point, if you look at it from the lateral, is not in the middle of the head. It's between the dorsal third and the middle third. And that's considered not to be the, the area that way bears when you're gripping. Uh, and the study by Thomas Gisson has, has looked at the area and they think that it is not too bad, it's not too much damage to the cartilage of the bone. That's provided you use the KY at lower speed and you're not burning 
calculus. If you KY gets hot, you'll get a big area of control ices. And if you go and revise one of them, you can see that there is the hole, but then they can be burned cartilage around them that doesn't recover. Uh, the, the other, the second technical point I wanted to make is that sometimes while you do these, you put the K wire and then you either rim it a bit or time to sink it, whatever you want. And then you put, you put a rimmer. And if you bend the wire a little bit, you can rim the K wire and you'll break the K wire. And then you have part of the K wire inside, part of the K wire outside, and you are snook it into a difficult position. So if you're using the rimmer and it gets hard, but just to stop and look, look what it is. Uh, the next point I wanted to make is that cannulated screws can be put without the K-wire. And sometimes that has the advantage. If the K-wire goes against the cortex and, and you're getting the, the screw towards there, take the K-wire out and the screw will find its way in or the remote will find its way in. will go in the area of, of less resistance. And then something else that John Thompson hinted is, is that <coughs> if, the, if the shaft of your screwdriver is bigger than your screw and you push the screw, you try to sink it in, you're going to crack the metacarpal head. Yeah. So if you look, for example, at the CCS with the metatarsal screw, the distal part of the screw is the same diameter than the screw. So you can sink it by about two centimeters if you want. But some 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 screw systems don't have that. The screwdriver is thicker than the screw, and if you don't appreciate that and you try to sink the screw in, you can you can crack the cortex. So you need to be very very careful with those things. Thank you, Carlos. Anyone, anyone uh, else want to uh, make any comments? I, I was going to, the, the last thing about, uh, yeah, Max, you want to say something? So just a question for the, for the regular users. How do you choose the diameter of the screw? Can I share my screen for a second? I'll just show you. Uh, so if you look at this, uh, this is just an oblique view with the wire partly in. So I uh, go into a couple of things. So I, at the beginning, I, I took a little bit of time to get used to exactly where to feel and to get my entry point correct. Uh, but again, like everything, there's a learning curve. Now, you know, I usually do it in my first pass uh, because I, I feel for the head and I kind of know where to go. Uh, if you look on here, it's do quite dorsal. It's not in the midpoint, it's quite dorsal. So we're a long way away from the load bearing surface of the... Of the Jamil, uh, just, uh, sorry, sorry, I'll start the I'll diameter. Start the diameter, the diameter here. here, sorry. Here, if you look here, the canal. So what I do is I measure that on the x-ray. Uh, so on the packs, uh, I always measure before and I look at the diameter there. If it's, if it's huge, then I use a three millimeter screw and uh, and I'm treating it like an internal splint, and I know that it's not going to be absolute rigid stability. If it's less than, if it's 2.2 or less, uh, then I will use the 2.2 screw, and I will uh, ream it. So I will put the the reamer through, and I will try and do it by hand if I can. If I can't, then I will uh, I will do it on power on low power, and I'll just gently get past where I think I need to be. If it's really small. Uh, then I won't do it at all. I won't, I'll do a different technique. Thank you. And that's often the problem with the fourth metacarpal. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to make another comment as an orthopedic surgeon and they can shout me down or, or back me up. Or back me up. But, um, I would say, I would that, say that this uh, technique is really only applicable to transverse fractures. If you're going to use it as a compression screw, a bit like we do for arthrodesis or across the, the, the scaphoid. Uh, I think it's really important that people recognize the limitations that if people try and do it with comminuted fractures or with long oblique fractures or spiral fractures, they'll end up in a disastrous situation. So uh, I just uh, would say to people, I, be very careful about I'd go on, the indication. I'd go on further as well. I think it needs to be in the, in the middle or distal around this area here, uh, because uh, so in the, in sort of the middle to the distal third, because you really want to have enough of the uh, the canal, the cortex to grip onto the screw proximally. If it's if it's too proximal, it won't work very well either. I don't think. So Jamil, there's a comment there from Will Mason about doing it uh, under one ant, and clearly you did do that one that you shared on the video under one ant. Uh, it strikes me as a procedure. Um, 
that you can do under one. And do you want to just make a very brief comment that, uh, or anybody, uh, Darius or Carlos or anybody who uses one? And I don't. I can. I, let me just show you this picture. Um, I have used I have it under one. Well, well, I'm. But I think. But I think uh, so I, I use about 10 mils of, of 1% lignocaine with adrenaline, uh, well, 9 mils and 1 mil of bicarb. Uh, and you see, I put a couple of injection ports, just uh, injection holes just here, just on either side of the metacarpal. I sometimes put a little bit on the side here, just underneath the hypothenar muscles, just to get around where the fracture might be. And I put another uh, little injection just where my, my uh, incision site is. And 10 mils is plenty, and it's fine, and they don't have any pain doing it. I do them routinely under this wallet now. J Jamil, don't you find that um, in very swollen hands with multiple metacarpals or, you know, in the case yeah. that I showed, they do get problems with pain. I think block is a little bit. Um, uh, so I have another case. I'm not going to show it. I can't find it easily now. Uh, so it's a double, it was a fourth and fifth. I did it like three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Uh, and what I do is I squeeze out as much of the edema as possible first. Mm -hmm. uh, gently, I put my hands on both sides and squeeze and I put the local in and I just, and I still do it. Uh, and it's fine. The only thing is that you're not going to get immediate early recovery because uh, because they've got a swollen hand, so they don't do as well. But you can still do it under local. Any other any other comments um, before we wrap it up? We said we'd uh, stick to one hour, and I think uh, we should stick to one hour. I've certainly uh, learned a lot. I'm going to go away and have a think about it. Um, and uh, I'm certainly uh, won't won't be uh, rushing in there to do it, but I will uh, get some plastic surgery trainee who's been to the Royal Free or elsewhere to show me how to do it properly. Eh? Are we okay to do a final poll, just out of interest? Of course, you can do a final poll. Okay, finally, after listening to the expert panel debate this evening, have you changed your mind about using headless compression screws for intermedullary <laughs> mid shaft metacarpal fractures? I'll give you another 10 seconds. Okay. That's everyone. Okay, 33% no, this technique will still not be part of my practice. 39, yes, I'm more interested. And then 28, this technique was already part. There we go. Okay, well, thank, that, thank you, uh, Emma, for, for organizing it. And uh, thank you to everyone who uh, dialed up and uh, listened in. And most of all, thank you to the people who took the time to do the presentations. Uh, and I hope we all meet sometime soon when COVID is over at a real meeting where we can actually chat face to face and uh, discuss all these problems that way. So thank you very much, everybody. And I'm going to leave you to finally. Enjoy your mile back. <laughs> Good night.